Welcome to Mohobe Nuggets of Wisdom podcast. My name is Mumpulu Kiluruma Mohobe. Our objective is to enthuse, inspire, energize, and empower entrepreneurs and entrepreneurs of all stripes here in BW and beyond. We do so by inviting these entrepreneurs and entrepreneurs into our makeshift studio. Sometimes we call them to the restaurant, sometimes we go uh, to our studio and we ask them to share their experiential knowledge, their experiences and their expertise. And we ask them uh, as many questions as we can aimed at empowering you also as a viewer. Hello viewer, hello listener. My name is Mumpulu Kiluruma Mohobe. Welcome once again to another wonderful and exciting episode of Mohobe Nuggets of Wisdom podcast. We're going to talk about all things property and I uh, brought in a property investor, uh, Ms. Uh, Alfred, Waganza Alfred. Welcome to the studio. Thank you. Yeah. Would you be kind enough to introduce yourself to our viewers in Welcome. terms of your background and what you do? Okay. First of all, uh, let me just say what an honor it is for you guys to have uh, chosen me, seen me worthy mm. to be on your show. <laughs> yes. I, I watch it religiously and I've enjoyed the guests that you've had on um, great minds and industry titans. Thank you. Yes. Um, my name is Oaganza Alfred. Mm. I am a property developer. Um, I am the founder and CEO of Lesedi Lebone Enterprises. We are a property development company founded in 2011. My entrepreneurship journey started uh, right after graduation. I graduated in 2009. Was, uh, from UB? Yes, it was mm. from BCA, BCA, Botswana College of Agriculture. Mm -hmm. It was uh, a recession year, so there weren't a lot of jobs. Mm. I remember I did uh, two months of internship, uh, and then I figured I wasn't a good fit. Um, by the time I graduated, I had already built my first house, mm -hmm. but the intention was to stay in it, and then I would just get a good job, and then buy a nice car and, mm. and I'd be set for life. Uh, <laughs> That's what <laughs> uh, you thought. Yeah. Yes, and, and to build that house, um, I used the proceeds um, that I saved from when I was in school. I used to sell stuff, stuff on campus. I used to sell anything I could get my hands on. Um, how I started selling was I wanted a car. Mm. So I was like, I want to be the cool kid. I'll be mm. in <laughs> universities. I'll be the girl driving my own car, blah, mm. blah, blah. And then... Uh, my parents weren't having it, so I had to raise my own funds. Mm -hmm. So yeah, um, I started selling and then soon I had the car and then when I graduated, that's I had already built the house and then here's this job, I don't like it. I'm already used to selling. So um, I was like, okay, I'll just sell the house and then I'll still, I'll keep doing it and doing it over again. Mm. Yes. So so uh, you, you're focusing on flipping in terms of building and then what americans call flipping you build and then you pass the house over to the next guy yes that's our main focus our mm. focus is really residential market for me i feel uh residential is it will never go out of fashion it's the future really i mean uh with office space we see people now uh, told to work from home uh even before COVID, there was already a system where other countries were starting to implement um, systems of people working from home but uh Owning a home will never go out of fashion. So I feel it's reliable. And if it were to me, even people who've invested in, in, in the commercial market offices, they would turn them into residential, really. There's a huge market for that. Okay. okay. Um, is it just multi res or single res that you're focusing? I am selling to individuals. So I'm building uh, homes for your typical family, Mozana family. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, so we built uh, three to four bedroom houses uh, in town, in Khaboroni and surrounding areas, but predominantly in Khaboroni. Yeah. As a property investor myself, I'm curious as to what you think of the state of the market currently. Um, the thing about our market is that it operates differently from the book and from what other people outside will say. So the unfortunate thing is that our education system, as with other subjects, is centered around what we learn from outside internal. But mm. there's not external, many, yes, mm. external. There's not many people writing for our market. Mm. 
Um, and we should really blame ourselves because we should be the ones who are writing what's really happening on the ground. For example, usually like a house in, in, in other countries, the older it is, the more value it accumulates. But here, as soon as you've sold a house, the minute somebody moves in, the following day you can't sell it for the same price that it was yesterday. Mm. It drops. Mm. Uh, so we don't really obey a lot of the, uh, the laws. Yes, we'll find, I think with COVID we'll, we will face challenges. But I don't think they're as drastic as uh, our banks are making it out to be. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, I, I think I, I, I have reason to say so because I, I, I'm on the ground. My feet are on the ground. I'm running on the ground. And we've not really struggled to sell houses. Mm. Uh, yes, banks are being a little tight with our money, but also we must see that there are a lot of people with cash at hand right now from the COVID tenders. Mm. So I think we'll just have to wait it out and see, but I doubt it will be as bad as everybody predicts it will be. Okay. Yeah. What do you currently have? How does your portfolio look like? Let's start there. Um, we've reduced the number of uh, houses that we are pushing into the market because we couldn't really predict what was going on. But I think uh, with the beginning of this year, I realized that we need to, uh, the, the, the market needs more houses still. So we, we are now building around four or five houses uh, at, a time. at a time and mm. then putting them into market house, seeing how the market reacts to that and then increasing okay. back to our usual amount. What would you say is your niche? What type of houses are you mainly targeting mm. to build and develop? We develop for uh, people with families, um, um, really, uh, usually uh, a husband and a wife, a typical Motswana family, uh, both working. So we're doing three bedroom houses, four bedroom houses uh, with uh, kids' bedrooms and open plan, kitchen, modern designs, really. Um, and they are in Khaburoni, uh, in bigger plots we put swimming pools and stuff like that. But uh, we try and uh, make it affordable to a lot of the working class. Okay. Yes. Um, and, and typically you are looking at a, a yard space of how much, how many square meters, and um, in terms of the size of the house, um, what percentage do you normally develop? Do you uh, look into those um, things? In town, really, because the, the plots in Botswana are really expensive. Um, uh, as we all know, it's not really a controlled uh, market, so everybody just throws the price. So what that has done is that it's in, in Khaburone, the, the plots are, are quite expensive. So when you, when you have a house in gaps, you tend to want to utilize the built-up space so you can make as much profit as possible. So uh, in a, a 300 square meter plot would would maximize all the spaces that the council uh, allows us to use and it would typically sell right now for 1.2 million 1.250 mm -hmm. and then uh, that's we range there from uh, we built from 900,000 all the way to 3 million okay yes in terms of your approach is it uh, what sort of material you use you use it blocks or stocks uh, um, do you find that it's is it important whether you go blocks or stocks? I've had some developers saying that they've had different results depending on what they use. Ah, uh, listen, we don't compromise on the quality of the product, mm. uh, so we use stocks. Mm -hmm. uh, we, uh, if they had anything tougher than stocks, I think we would use that. So mm. structurally, I think one of our competitive edges is that uh, we really ensure that our product quality is of top notch okay yes so i and i think that's also our competitive edge um, even our finishes i think being a woman as well has been a, a, an advantage uh, if i can tell you people who usually buy houses in botswana are mostly women mm -hmm. yes and if it's not women because then the husband sends their wife not really oh. just single women buy more houses than single men one mm -hmm. two and then with a married couple the woman still decides uh, which house to get. So mm -hmm. I think being a woman has, uh, has had its advantages okay. in a male-dominated field. Mm. Yeah, uh, when we discussed this, you said it's important to know your agent. Why is it important to know an agent? And what's the role of an agent in this, in this whole, s in your current setup? Listen, um, this is some of the stuff that they don't teach you at school. Um, Yes, there are agents on the ground, but there are different, what I've noticed is that there are different kinds of agents. 
there are agents who will help you acquire land who are good at that mm. and then there are agents who will help you sell the house they're just good at that there are agents for farms they're just good at that somehow it's hard to find somebody who who's an all-rounder mm. so you need to know your agents from the ground up who's going to find you the best land who's going to convince who knows the the rules of land and then who is who has better relationships with banks who is going to get you somebody who really qualifies so for you to be a property developer uh, one of the key elements is that you need to know your agents and establish good relationships uh, with your with your property agents what what method do you use to determine whether this tenant this agent is good or not how do you go about identifying the good ones um Unfortunately, some of it is a, is a lot based on experience, right? So <laughs> they could, <laughs> yes, mm. they could be registered and all, but um, I've I've also had my bad, my fair share of bad experiences with some agents, and some are really good. Mm. Uh, I mean, some are very efficient. Uh, and uh, as a developer, you are competing for land with other developers to, to get the land. So, uh, whoever w is able to to get you the land, you tend to stick with that. And mm. then there'll be other agents who'll be uh, saying, give me a deposit first for me mm. to be able to. And you learn along the way that it's not the right way to go about it. And uh, really, experience is the best teacher. I'm but you can learn from other people's experiences and, and, and avoid the pitfalls. Yeah, I'm yeah. biased a little towards a buy and hold strategy. Yeah. You know, I believe in holding a property forever. It's clear from what you're telling me that you're something of a flipper. You pass the properties yes. on. What, why did you choose to flip as opposed to buy and hold? Uh, I think uh, there's a difference between being a property investor and being a property developer and running a property bus as a business, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I think keeping is more of an investment plan because uh, typically, well, let's just look at the numbers. Uh, you, you, how much do you use to build that property once? How many years is it going to take for you to recover that money back? Two, will you still be there to enjoy that? Are you doing it for others? So it's more of an investment. It's more of a retirement plan, or it's 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 any. But it's not really a business. Uh, for me, as a business, I need to make quick cash and keep the cash flow growing. Use some of that cash to invest in mm -hmm. property by keeping. But majorly, the business part of it is really flipping, making my profit, and moving on. Mm. Yes, we keep some, but for investment. You s for like a typical two-bedroom house in Kokwing, the land inclusive will be 800,000. And you will get 3.5. 3,500 pula. Tell me how long it will take for you to get your 800,000 pula back. Yeah, well, yeah, I, I, yeah you're, you're right. But, I mean, they, both sides are right. Depends on your yes. strategy. Yes. Because my approach would be, let's have this asset you know, generate more cash versus having this money in the bank. Yes. Generating close to nothing. Yes, I mean, having money in the bank is assuming that you are not investing it back. So, by keeping a property, mm -hmm. that's what I'm saying. That that system is more of an investment, but it's not a business. Mm -hmm. Multi-residential property is an investment. It's not a business. Mm -hmm. There's a difference there. There's a thin difference between businesses about quick cash, quick returns, and building capital. Cash flow. Yes, cash mm. flow and building capital. But investment is about here's this extra cash that I have. I don't want it to sit here and not grow. Where can I put it such that I still have it, but it is also accumulating interest? Mm. Yes. All right. Um, don't buy or sell without a lawyer or a contract. Is there somebody who still does that? You'll be shocked. Mm -hmm. <laughs> You'll be shocked. I think people have yeah. really sweet tongues out there. And you can get really s swingled. Uh, and we cannot s stop stressing this, mm. this point. No matter how much, um, you need to make sure that you have due diligence. Do you have any um, horror stories to share? Sure. Mm. I've had a lot. I mean, um, there are some loopholes as well, which I think we need to cover in terms of the law. I remember there was once a plot. I bought a plot from a, an old man. It was a development agreement. We did the contract still. 
and uh, went about doing the plans and everything, gave him a deposit. I think the deposit must have been around 300,000. Okay, I trust him, he's really old. So I, I, I'm, I'm just very comfortable, right? Mm. And then somebody calls and says, hey, I'm a lady, I'm in South Africa. I found out you were digging in my plot. I bought that plot 10 years ago. Mm. We went with the gentleman to apply for a new title deed. He said that he'd lost the title deed. He hadn't actually lost the title deed. He had sold the property 10 years ago, saw the property still sitting, and decided, let me sell again. Now tell me how you recover money from somebody like that. <laughs> and does a lawyer necessarily protect you from that? They don't, mm. because... But at we least went you to have an we agreement to work with when you go to court. But even taking him to court, so how much will you salvage? Mm. He's old, he has next to nothing. All he had is the money that you gave him. He's over 65, 70. Are you sending him to jail or anything? Mm. So you, tr you go to the deeds, you check, is this really his plot? Yes, it's his plot. Everything is done right, but it still doesn't give you that protection. So in terms of a development contract with you, yeah. typically what is the process involved and where do the lawyers come in? From the very beginning, once the agent has identified a willing seller, I, the willing buyer, will then meet at the lawyers where all the terms will be laid down on the contract, when, so who gets paid when, who has possession when, and all of that. And then they'll get that deposit, we'll hold some money until the transfer is done into now the new buyer. And what clauses do you put there just to protect yourself, to make sure that everything is watertight? We say that with the, they can't get the final payment until they've helped us throughout the process. We, we make them sign powers of attorneys and all of that. But as you know, the laws can change as well, and you still need that, uh, the person to be. And we also get possession of the property upon the deposit of the, the first amount. Yeah, Americans yeah. say possession is nine-tenths of the law. So yes. So <laughs> it's, it's probably yeah. um, a way of protecting you. Yeah. Um, know your market. It's very clear to me that you know the market fairly well. What I'm curious to know is what you did to really, really get to know the market. What did you, how did you go about the process of becoming the master of the market, as it were? You know, uh, the thing about a business is if you have time for it and you really listen to it, it will speak to you. So again, it's mostly experience, but it's also how fast you learn. Are you paying attention to your business as it's also growing? Or are you busy now, you're just enjoying the money that's coming in? Uh, when I first started, I built a house that was, for me, I thought if I like this, then everybody should like it. I put all sorts of folding doors and, and I started selling it and people didn't want to buy it because they had security issues. Mm. It turns out people don't like too much glass because they're like, oh, we don't feel safe in this place. So I had to stop to think about what I liked and start thinking, what is an average Motswana who I'm trying to sell to like? What That's when mean? I started learning, collecting research on who's really buying. Is it the guy that comes to see the house in the expensive car, or is it the guy who comes in the less priced car? And it turned out that um, people with really expensive cars didn't really buy much because most of our cash was tied up in, in, in loans. In fleshy things. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes. And that's something that I had to learn as well. And then also to just know that women are buying more. So the house has to appeal more to the woman. I can't make a man cave mm. because I know the family will not buy that house even though the men will like it. I went through the process where the man says, yes, we want the property. We are buying it. Make the offer. The woman comes and says, no. No way am I Yes, buying but that. as soon as the woman says we're buying this house, then I know for sure we're buying. Mm -hmm. So a part of it is really learning. And if you listen to the business, it will really speak to you. It will tell you where it needs to go. Okay. Um, building your team. Uh, talk about the team. How many people do you employ and in what positions? And how did you go about building the team? Um, I have about 70 people mm -hmm. on and off. Yes. Um, it took me years to build a really good team. I mean, construction workers, there was, when I started this, I was in my really early 20s. I must have been 23 or so. And then uh, you're employing somebody who's in their 50s, they're, they are men. They're, 
also the sexist thing mm. that they've been building for <laughs> for a long time and this, just this free little girl trying mm. to tell this man how, what to do mm. and this is the approach that i had was wrong i was stern i was uh, but I had to, yes, I was very aggressive because I was like, hey, listen to me, you, because I'm trying to, I'm to get my boss. voice. Yes, <laughs> I'm a boss. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And they quickly showed me that that system wasn't going to work. Mm. Uh, and then I started to understand that uh, you have to really forge relationships. Relationships are really important. Um, you start to see them as humans. You talk to them as humans. You understand their lives. Mm. Uh, you know about their whole family. Uh, that softens you as well. You start to care about people and because you know how they live and and all of a sudden even what you're doing becomes very important mm. because you know this ship, this ship can't sink because so many people are dependent on this not failing and they also start respecting you more because you start telling them your vision for the business they mm. understand what you are doing mm. they understand your your goal so well as soon they as buy in. yes they mm. buy into it and everything starts to flow and th that means that even your work becomes less. Mm -hmm. So we have a whole range of people from uh, the bricklayers to the carpenters who do the roofing. We have a whole other team that does kitchens, tiling, plumbing. We have people for waterproofing, swimming pools, you name it, we can do it. What about your professional team, architects and engineers? We have architects we work with, we have uh, an engineer that we, that we work with, but uh, the engineer comes as per when we need them. In other words, it's a yes. contractor, yes. independent contractor. Yes, yes. Okay. Now, um, if we were to advise somebody wanting to replicate a property business, what do you think is the main key in terms of, in terms of uh, team building? What do you think is the central consideration? I think holistically, I will just say relationships with all the stakeholders involved. Mm -hmm. I mean, um, for me, a system that has really worked for me is really based around the relationships. Like systems like bootstrapping, for example, uh, I forge relationships with people who, has, who supply materials. I don't have to pay them now. Mm. I can pay them later. Even if I have the money, mm. it still doesn't matter because they can give me stuff on credit and I can use the money that I have towards building more projects. Mm. So even with uh, building a team, the relationships really are at the core of business. Even with your agents, you want your things to go, go smoothly. Even if it's not even about getting s stuff on credit, it's about getting stuff on time, and getting the best land before everybody else. So mm. relationships are really key. OK, quality assurance, uh, getting uh, focusing on product quality. Yes. How do, you foc how do you do that? How do you handle that aspect? Um, I make sure that I've hired the right people. And I think I'm at a position now where um, the ship is really just sailing without too much of my assistance because my People are very professional. Our finishes are very competitive. I, I'm yet to see somebody who, who builds three beds that are better than ours, <laughs> dare I say. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right? That's, that's yeah. powerful, but yeah. I mean, you're obviously biased. <laughs> Understandably, yes. yeah. So, so, yeah. so then, then, then um, would you, would you, um, you involve a structural engineer at some point in terms yes, of quality? Yes, we do. We yeah. do involve structural engineers. Um, mm. And as well, uh, most of the time people buy, they get finance from the bank and the bank does its own due diligence. They mm -hmm. send people over. They send our own inspectors. We also have the council inspectors, so we have all the certificates that are necessary. And after selling a house, we stay with a client for six months to ensure that uh, the product is to their satisfaction. It's a house. Nobody's lived in it. It's a brand new house. We can't mm. know what is wrong with it. The rainy season is coming. We don't know if you're going to have leaks. But you have assurance that we are there for you for at least six months. Suppose I approach you and say, look, I need a house for my family, four bedrooms. How much time do I give you? I mean, uh, are there an, an, a situation where money is not an object? How, on average, how long does it take for you to come up with a product? more than three months really mm -hmm. the the part that takes time is the structural work uh, the brick work because you you set you, you need to dig the setting you you pour in you have to let it sit there's all of that critical points of waiting for 
for things to set. Mm. But the finishes really don't take much time. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, now, this one is one of my favorite points. The need to build relationship with stakeholders. Yeah. Um, I, I suppose you're talking about suppliers. Yes. Um, what were the challenges associated with that? And how do you go about doing that? I think uh, if somebody sees your face consistently, they start to know you're there as well. Uh, so it wasn't, it wasn't much of a big challenge, building relationships, I think. Uh, it just also stems from who you are as a person. Uh, if you work well with people, it, mm. will, it will work for you and it will work for your business. Mm. I mean, um, some of the houses I've sold, is I got the clients from my previous clients. Mm who then say, oh, my cousin's working for a house. And, th and that just goes to show even the relationship that we have with our clients, even how they trust our work, that they are willing to recommend us to somebody else. Most, so. most entrepreneurs are, are challenged in terms of building relationships with the bankers. Is it something that you've encountered? How do you go about that one? Um, I think one of my challenges was I, when I started my business, it was too soon for me to approach the bank or any finance, yeah. Um, and in hindsight, I think it was a blessing in disguise. Because I don't believe that you should get funding too soon. I don't believe in um, funding startups really. I think uh, funding is good for expansion, growth. for yes. growth, not necessarily for startups. Where possible, mm. you start with your own money, make those mistakes, make it watertight. That's when you can get somebody to invest in your business, somebody else to invest in your business and then growth. So really, um, once your balance sheet, once your, your, the, bank, the, 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 the bank looks at your balance sheet and it looks okay, you don't have any issues. People now start calling you, they want to invest. The very people who rejected you will now call you and say, hey, mm. if you need any money, we are here for you. Well, so, I've made the observation yeah. that the bank doesn't give you money unless you don't need it. Yes. <laughs> they only give, give you money when you don't need it. Yes, they only give you money when yeah. you don't. But you always need somebody else's money. <laughs> yeah. So, so yeah. ultimately, but you did still have to go to the bankers. How do you cultivate that relationship, especially in the real estate space? Uh, for me, I kept a really good balance sheet. I always made sure. I'd, I've never been that person who where uh, my account would be, uh, I would wait for it to get to the zeros. I used to pace myself such that the cash flow would look, because they only look that at the money that's coming in really. They don't know what's going on in your business. So just make sure that it never looks like you're struggling or you're stranded. No matter how you're struggling, there always has to be that amount that you say, I, have no, I don't have to go below this amount of mm. money as well. So I think just doing uh, your business properly and making sure that your numbers uh, look good. Uh, I'm a numbers person. I think that's one of my, my strengths. Mm. So I always make sure that my numbers are good, that if an investor wants to come on board, then they also have records to show that this is a growing business. So if you keep your records right, the business is good. It doesn't even have to be a bank. People will, will want a piece of your cake. Mm. Yeah. You advise strongly against using your business as a piggy bank. Yes. Have you seen that happening and what are the dangers there? Yes, I mean... Uh, Maybe you should explain to people what you mean first. <laughs> what I meant by that is that most of the time where as an entrepreneur, as a, let's say you're starting your business and it's just you, you have access to all this cash. But you have to separate yourself from the business. There's you and your salary and then there's the business and its money. When you are the only person running the show and there's no board to account to, you tend to forget all that and throw all the rules and then you, say, you see all these nice things that you cannot afford and start using the business money too. And that's very dangerous because you're really creeping into the, the cash flow of your business and you're hindering uh, with the growth. It's, some, it's one of the things that I, I struggled with. I think I still do, but I'm trying to get a grip on it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but... Uh, I think it's really key. 
because you have all this access to this cash that's not yours. So you have so to establish. So what what systems do you put in place to make sure that you don't you don't you don't use your business as a piggy bank? Get a really professional accountant <laughs> who won't let you do and just self discipline is very important as well. Mm. Uh, and your business should always have a bigger plan because I fe I feel people use money well when they have a bigger plan. When you have money but you don't have a plan, that's when you start misu misusing the funds. When you have a plan, the funds are never enough. So you're looking into putting more instead of taking out. Okay. Um, reinvest the proceeds into the business. I yeah. think that one I agree with. Yeah. Reinvest in the proceeds. I mean, for many years, I didn't even take a salary myself. Yes. Mm. And I think the same goes for anybody who's started a business from the ground up. There's no way you're starting a business today and then at the end of the month you're getting a salary. And even to date, I'm still the last person to get paid. I if I get paid. With that one. If I get I, paid. I, 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 I think you, you, shouldn't, you may be the last person to get paid, but let, let, let your s allow yourself to be an investor. In other words, invest something from your proceeds. Either you invest it back or you, you save it for future investment. That's what I believe. Yes, but you have to get to that point first. Mm -hmm. They can't be at the beginning and you're already investing and you're already taking money before people. You have to make sure that this mm -hmm. thing is safe and secure mm -hmm. before you start rewarding yourself. Mm -hmm. Yes, you see the light. It's coming. One day you'll be able to do all of those things. But when it's still starting out, you have to make the sacrifice. So for you, how long did it take before you started, you started even drawing a salary? I mean... Uh, how long did you invest the money back into the business? Well, I'm still investing the money back, but now I have a salary and I've had a salary for a couple of years. But that is not to say if, the, if we go through a hard time, it's a privilege that I will gladly take away. Mm. Yes. So firstly, I have to make sure that all the families are fed because this is not about me anymore. It's about other people as well. It's about kids going to school. It's, it's about... 60 something families, 70 people putting their kids through school and taking care of their whole zone. And that comes before me. So once you see things in that perspective and you see how your actions can have a ripple effect on other people's lives, you make your decisions wiser. So even if we go through a hard time, I'll be the first person to take away the privilege. Mm. So look into the future. What would you say are your medium? and long-term plans for the business? Uh, right now, to be honest, we're really trying to stay afloat past the pandemic and see how things pan, pan down. But uh, hopefully in the future, we could get people to invest in our business. Uh, the property market in Botswana is very stable and it's good for anybody who's outside who wants to invest uh, in us. Mm. <laughs> and, and we also want to expand to, to other countries as well. Uh, we've identified uh, a few countries that we feel our model could also work there. Tell us more. Let <laughs> 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 me speak about a country like Namibia for one. Mm. Um, our money is stronger, the Pula. So if you go there already, you have more. Two, they have a system where they s uh, the government goes into partnerships with, uh, with uh, developers. So they give you a chunk of land and then you can uh, have sectional titles and build all these houses in, 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 in that space. And there's a dire need for accommodation in Namibia. Uh, so they're willing to have people over and we have the experience for it. So it's something that we really want to, to pursue. Mm -hmm. Yes. So you're currently exploring that? Yes. And, and so where do you see yourself in five years, for instance? Hopefully we would be in more countries. Mm. Uh, and hopefully as well, we would be working with our government as well mm. uh, in terms of the construction tenders and everything. That's something that we are also interested in. Does the new Africa trade agreement assist the uh, developers and property investors in any way? Have you looked at that? I haven't. I hope it does. Because mm. <laughs> we will take advantage of all the systems that are put in place. I think it's worth in yes. investigating. Yes. Yeah. Um, funding. You say funding is an important ingredient for growth. Yes. I agree with you. Uh, do you want to add? 
you want to say more on that subject? Um, yes, I think that usually two types of people. There are people who uh, like to ask for money from, from people, who, and then there are people who are really afraid mm. of asking uh, for money from people. And uh, when you are starting your business, it's good to be afraid of using other people's money. Mm. Because you want to learn on your, you make your own mistakes without h having to find yourself in, in, in debt. Um, but as you grow and your business grows, you need to shift your mind more towards using other people's money to grow. Because you do need uh, money from other people to grow. You can't just use, you can't just keep reinvesting and hope for exponential growth. So funding is essential for, for exponential growth, for you to, to push you to another level. What, so do you, what do you say to those who are petrified of debt? But that is part of life. I mean, it, and it doesn't, like you were saying earlier, mm. the right time to use other people's money is not, is not when you need it. Mm. it. Because you make the best deals then. If somebody gives you a bad rate, you walk away because you, it's not a matter of life and death. Mm. So, yeah. Okay. Um, this is the part of the show. But before I ask you about that, let me just uh, have an idea as to whether you... Are you as obsessed about property as I am? And if so, uh, what books or what podcasts do you, do you get into to develop your taste more or to feed your hunger for property knowledge? Well, I, I am obsessed about property. I've been obsessed about property. I've, I've been obsessed about nice things since from an early age. Mm. So, yes, I'm always watching what's the latest, what's happening. Um, what is the new technology with houses? Um, unfortunately, I'm operating in a market that is limiting me in terms of technology. Uh, as soon as we start putting all these coffers for insulation, big on insulation, and we start uh, drawing curtains that close when you clap your hands, or <laughs> it'll make the houses really expensive, and a lot of people won't have access to them. But mm. I. I read, I watch a lot of television, I enjoy these television shows that show how other markets operate. I enjoy reading business books, I've read all the famous ones, the rich dads, uh, mm. poor dads, the mm. uh, capitalist niggers, the, and the 5 AMs now, mm. there's mm. always, uh, every year I've noticed that there comes a list of mm. highly recommended I like books. the 5 AM yes. club. Yes. It's the uh, yes. Shama. Yes, yeah, yeah, yes. I love that book. <laughs> um, yes. Okay. But uh, mostly, I think I, I think experience is really one of those things. You really just need to get your, your feet on the ground. Mm. Okay. Yeah. I see you're focused in Khaborone. Any chance of moving to Maung and Francistown? No. Nah, not really. <laughs> Why is that? Uh, the property market in Francistown right now is... Sun is not really growing as fast. And, and what you get in terms of if you build in Gaps and if you build in Francistown, what you get in Francistown is way less. Mm. So we're not really looking to grow mm. <laughs> in that direction. Uh, I think Mawung is good. The property market would be really good for people who, who also want to invest in tourism as well. So, yeah, I think in terms well, of property, I'm property I'm is very broad. I'm, I'm in Mawung. Uh, yeah. Very uh, extensively but yeah. we had to sort of scale back when COVID came into yeah. the picture yeah. and the banks are very reluctant now with Maung now having regard to yeah. what's happened to the tourism industry Financing, things yeah. Like that, yeah. so th the good thing about property is that it's so broad there's really everything everything is on a piece of land so everything really is property if you look at uh, what uh, people are doing now you you can uh, rent out a place, you can build a place and then equip it with all the medical stuff and then just get all the doctors and rent them chairs in there. And still, it's a property business because yeah. you're not really a doctor. You're, you're a facilitator of the clinic. But really, you, what you're doing is you're in the property business. There's so in much In other words, the do. possibilities are endless The possibilities property. for property are endless and limitless. Mm. No, I agree with yeah. you. Yeah, that's why I love it so much. Mm. This is where you get to ask me any question you want. What is your opinion on what is going to happen with the property market in Botswana? Post-COVID or during COVID? During COVID. 
It's difficult to say. Uh, if I had the crystal ball, I'd say that we we're going to ride the um, the storm. Um, there's no indication that the market is collapsing or anything like that. Yeah. So I'm, I remain optimistic. Although we are struggling with a lot of our tenants, uh, uh, I think there was a time I was getting numbers like 30% default rate. Yeah. And uh, we had to really jack up our debt collection team to, to chase <laughs> after those debtors. So that told me that, look, these sort of default rates we have never seen before. Um, but I think since we stopped uh, with the lockdowns. What I fear is that we cannot survive the lockdowns, yeah. but we can survive the curfew, we can survive other restrictions. But lockdowns are terrible for property. They're just terrible because people can't you function. No movement, yeah. so, so if we can find ways and learn from other countries where yeah. we use other systems yeah. for controlling COVID other than lockdowns. Lockdowns is like uh, kill an ant with a hammer. Yeah. Really, uh, it's y in the end, you destroy <laughs> the whole house. But sure. uh, but I'm very optimistic. I'm an eternal optimist myself. Yeah. I'm not thinking of disin disin disinvesting or in property or anything like that. Yeah. I, if anything, we're actually uh, purchasing. Uh, we're looking for multi-residentials. Yes. We're looking for commercials. We're looking for industrials. So we are doubling down. Although the market is a bit challenging, but because well, we have the right a time to buy. Yes, yes, it's the right time to buy, especially mm, if you yeah. have a long term yeah. focused mm. and if the bankers are on board, yeah. uh, which they are. I hope I've answered your question. Yes, you have. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Now, I want you to talk to the viewers and tell them why you're so obsessed with property. And um, or before you do, what do you think sets apart your company? your company from all the other property companies that don't make it in the end. What, what is that di distinguishing factor? I've been meaning to ask you that. I almost forgot. <laughs> yeah. um, I think, like you said, the passion for property. Mm. I know property. I've lived and breathed it. Mm. Um, so I know what works, and I am from here. I'm a woman. Like I said, people are, who are buying here are women, or people who are deciding, a big deciding factor in terms of houses. And I'm a woman. I have the feminine touch. Mm. I come with that. The product is quality. We've been in many years. We've never had complaints. And few women. So really, that sets my houses apart from men. And mm. what I've seen even happen is um, I will start a new house. I'll make the changes uh, and, and have... Uh, a new look and then soon the men will come and look and then they will try and mimic yeah. <laughs> and yeah. Yeah. yeah so yeah i think uh, one of the advantages really have have been that it, my houses have feminine touch and the quality is very good i cannot stress whatever mm. business you're doing the product quality needs to be top notch and, and that will help you sell quick mm -hmm. yeah. now look at that camera yeah uh, leave i want you to leave the listeners the viewers with something motivational, something inspirational, a word of wisdom, something to take home. One of the things that I, I'd say that um, business is not easy, but it is very possible. Uh, so don't get discouraged. I started with next to nothing and I am somewhere. <laughs> so I'd say it's not easy, but it is very possible. Okay. Yeah. If the viewers wish to get in touch with you or to take advantage of your services, tell them how they can we reach you. We are at block 10, plot 57534. That's block 10, plot 57534. And you can reach me directly on uh, my Facebook or Aganza Alfred. Oaganza Alfred on Instagram and um, on any other social media. So Oaganza Lesedi Alfred. And my cell phone number is 7538-3141. Let's have the property discussions. Thank you very much. You've been a wonderful guest. Thank you for having You've me. You've done very well. <laughs> Thank you.